So good evening, everybody. It is a joy to see you all uh, in the middle of this um, Advent season that we gather tonight to um, uh, have a conversation and hold space for the spiritual practice of lament. Um, I will ask um, Pastor Danielle to start uh, showing our uh, PowerPoint for us to have a um, um, view about our agenda tonight. Um, uh, our hope is that this session may inspire and encourage you to embrace the spiritual practice of lament uh, in our personal life and the life of your congregation. Uh, we will read uh, a psalm of lament, we'll hear a prayer of lament, and we'll together engage in a prayer of lamenting uh, racism. Um, after that, we will be uh, guided to uh, write our own lament. We will not ask you to share your prayer of lament, but we will hold space in the breakout rooms uh, to talk about how this experience was for you and how you can apply it in the life of your congregation. Pastor uh, Jessica Lambert was uh, able and um, uh, to, to be with us tonight and will share about how her congregation had engaged uh, with the question, what keeps you up uh, at night? Towards uh, the end of uh, our evening together, we will have a video of one of our team members encouraging us all to grip the, with the practice of lament. So let's start with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. God, good and gracious God, as we gather here this evening and engage in this conversation and practices of prayers of lament, Draw us to your heart, guide our minds, fill our imagination, recreate us so what re that we reflect your willingness. Renew us in your love. Thank you for this, your leaders that are here joining tonight and bless those that could not be with us. Set us back, all of us into the path of right relationship as you desire to us. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine, Russia, and other places of war and violence around the world. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear that you would hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, amen. Dear sisters and brothers, when we think about the term lament, um, uh, I think it's uh, good for us to go back and think as a verb, to feel that to um, to feel, show, or express grief, sorrow, and regret, to mourn deeply, but also as a noun, uh, crying out in grief, wailing. So tonight we will engage with in the beginning with a psalm of lament. And always uh, that is that uh, in the Psalms, the Psalmist ask God for deliverance from suffering, sorrow, great loss, failures and enemies. And these petitions often give way to expressions of trust in God to act in the Psalmist favor, leading to hope and joy. In the books of Psalms, they are the called classic laments found in Psalm 13 and 22 that are individual laments. And then and on Psalm 44 and 60, 
for instance, there are communal laments. In the lament, the speaker complains, ask God for help, and usually also express trust and promises to continue to praise God. The lament is a form of speech that has largely been lost in our society and in the life of our churches, where people are not at home with complaining to God, even at times of accusing God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As it says in Psalm 22. But the Bible teaches that a relationship with God in this fallen world is a relationship that can and perhaps must include such accusations and laments. God knows we live in the midst of brokenness, sin, suffering, and doubt. Those realities are part of our relationship with God, admitting them to God carrying them to God in prayer is not to show lack of faith, but to participate fully in a faith relationship with God. God is more than faithful enough to accept our deep pain, our doubts, our laments, and our anger. So pain, anger, grief, trauma, and sorrow must be expressed offered up, held and felt, or it holds the power to eat us from inside out. Scripture never tells us to bur bury our emotions or our honest response as an act of faith. Rather, we have this spiritual practice of lament that welcomes our fullness self, our deepest pain. The Old Testament professor Walter Brueggemann and the article, The Costly Loss of Lament, argues that when the lament sounds are no longer used for their specific social function, it is a loss in faith and in life. Lament is necessary in part of a covenantal faith with God. By suppressing this form of uh, speech, the faith community becomes increasingly deaf to cries, cannot hear the cries in the face of injustice. In other words, the ability to raise justice, justice question is diminished and loses its ability to discern the complex ambiguities they reflect. Lamenting before God for ourselves and one another's behalf draw us to into deep connection with God and others. Lamenting is not only for the suffering, it is for solidarity with the suffering. We love our neighbors when we allow their experience um, of pain to become a substance of our prayer. And so we start with the prayer uh, of lament of Psalm 146. Pastor Judy. Actually, I'm having a crisis right now because all of the information I have says that Psalm 146 is a hymn of praise, but that's okay. <laughs> so, um, and I had asked, oh, I'll do this because we just did this in a Bible study. We just were looking at Psalms together. Um, but can we have a volunteer to read um, read the Psalm? And I only see about four of you. So Maybe if someone would chat me. Judy, I'll read it. It's Carol Lindsay. Carol, thank you. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are they whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, 
the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. Thank you, Carol. Um, as I said, Psalm 146, I, in all my notes, says it's a hymn of praise, and it's one of the last five psalms concluding the book of Psalms. Um, it actually begins with the Hebrew word Hallel, or praise the Lord, as you can see, and it ends with the same, uh, the same words. Um, but I think that we could tie this into the fact that um, in spite of our laments, in spite of all the things that we cry out to God for and, and lament and cries to God characterize many, many of the Psalms. This Psalm um, does conclude as we're ra wrapping down the book of Psalms on a note of praise and worship with a very loud and clear proclamation that God is faithful and that we can place our utmost trust in God. So as we think about prayers of lament tonight, um, it, is our, it is in our lament and our pleading to God that we cry out to God to pay attention to us in our suffering and in our pain. The book of Psalms, as Maristella said, is full of such laments or cries to God. Some scholars say roughly two thirds of the book of Psalms are lament Psalms. And uh, Maristella referenced Psalm 22, which we'll be reading uh, during Holy Week. Jesus prayed it from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, very raw emotion, very uh, legitimate emotion, very real emotion, and that is clear throughout the Psalms. So I think the Psalms remind us, they encourage us to bring our pain to God and to know that we are okay to do that. Um, I think sometimes we're afraid to bring our pain to God. And the Psalms remind us that God hears our prayers and works even in the midst of our pain. But at the same time, we remember that our final prayer is one of praise. We know what God has done for us in the person of Jesus. So we know that our God meets us in our suffering and in our pain. And that's why we can praise our God even in the middle of our lament. So N.T. Wright says that prayers of lament are in the meantime prayers. Most of the Psalms of lament do in fact end with praise, including Psalm 22, it's, it's interspersed in there. Um, so we can praise God again, because we know that our story does not end in sorrow, but rather our story ends with Hallel or praise the Lord, who in the end will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Pastor Jay, you may continue. So <clears throat> you will be working on a prayer of lament as uh, as part of the, the exercise towards the end of our session. We actually did this ourselves as well. And um, Pastor Maricela asked if one of us would share our prayer of lament. And this is what I wrote during our time of uh, reflection. God of promise and hope, you who promised descendants to Sarah and Abraham, you who promised life abundant through your son Jesus, Holy One, why do your promises exhaust my soul? My words seem empty as I speak of your promises. I long to hear your voice speak peace into being. What would you have me say to bring peace to your children in Ukraine? In what way might I help to bring sense to a world of chaos? What words of armor would you have me speak to those who are oppressed for the color of their skin, 
the language they speak or who they love. What would you have me do to calm my own heart and the hearts of others? I long to hear your voice to still my quaking heart. Forgive me, Lord, for distractions crowd my mind. Have pity on me for my inability to discern your voice in the midst of the cacophony of voices demanding my attention. I pray that you will help me to hear your voice with more clarity. I seek only the direction you would have me go. I pray that I might passionately console others who are also frightened and troubled. Send your Holy Spirit to burn within me that I may be an instrument of your love and justice. As you promised Sarah and Abraham, their progeny continue to fill our planet. So too do you fill me with hope. When I am fearful, it is to you that I seek solace. When I am without words, it is your voice for which I yearn. You are holy and immortal. Your love has spanned the ages and will continue through eternity. I praise you for being God, the only God. I thank you for loving me and your whole creation. I promise, Lord, that I will try listening, for it is your voice for which I yearn. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jay, for sharing that. That was beautiful. As we met together and we planned uh, for this evening, we we didn't all share all of our prayers together, so I hadn't had a chance to hear that yet. But it was it was beautiful, and so thank you for sharing that. Um, at this time, we are going to move into doing the litany of um, lamenting racism, which is. Um, actually in the All Creation Sings uh, hymnal. So I'm gonna lead us through this. Um, it came in the email for tonight, but it's also here on your screen. So feel free to participate as we get to the litany part of lamenting racism. The sin of racism hurts communities of color fractures human relationships, and denies God's good creation. Lament is a way for us to recognize the harm caused by racism. And as we know from Romans chapter 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God's grace in Christ frees us for the difficult work of recognizing and lamenting racism. We are all a part of one body in Christ, called to act with equity, fairness, and justice. God's saving love creates grace-filled spaces within us and within our relationships. God's saving love calls and leads us towards rooting out the racism that continues to infect the body. Within the whole human family, people of color have experienced both interpersonal aggression and structural oppression instead of abundant life. We recognize and lament the harm racism has caused to African descent communities, American Indian and Alaska native communities, indigenous peoples within Canada, Arab and Middle Eastern communities, Asian and Pacific Islander communities, and Latinx communities. We cry out to you. Hear our lament, our lament oh God. God. We have assigned the notion of race to human beings created in God's own divine image. We have judged God's beautiful diversity by our flawed and artificial standards. We cry out to you, 
Hear our Lord. Lord. Amen. 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 We have used language and images in ways that equate black and dark with dirt and sin. And that fail to welcome the treasures of darkness in God's good creation. We cry out to you. Hear, hear, hear our, our lament, O oh God. Oh God. God. We have accepted practices in our churches and in our society that privilege whiteness over diversity and equity. We have been complicit in how racism continues to exclude and harm people of color. We cry out to you. Hear our lament, O God. When one part of the body of Christ hurts, the whole body hurts. As we listen to people who are harmed by racism, we call to you, open our hearts, O oh God. As we reflect on our daily interactions with people and communities of color, we call to you, open our and hearts, O oh God. God. As we consider what we have been taught about race and racism, we call to you. Open, Open our hearts, our hearts oh, God. oh God. As we contemplate what we have done and what we have left undone, we call to you. Open, Open our, our hearts, hearts oh, God. oh God. As we labor to create a loving and safe community for our siblings of color, we call to you. Open, Open our hearts, hearts to God. God. Holy and merciful God, as your people, we recommit ourselves to loving one another as you have loved us. Prepare us for this time of listening and discovery. We pray in the name of the one who has made us one, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So in a moment, as, as Jay mentioned, uh, you all are going to have an opportunity to write your own prayers of lament. And quickly, I just wanted to give a description of what the parts of these of this practice will look like. And then Pastor Jill will have more direction as, as she guides us through it. Um, but there's, there's six main parts here in which we address God, we give our complaint, we have a time of confession, we ask for God's help, we are firm our trust in God, and then we promise to praise God. And as we've mentioned already throughout our evening together, we know that, of course, there are members of the body of Christ who will lament more than others. And, but the reality is that we all are, none of us are free from suffering or grief or losses. Um, and we all know that, especially to be true with everything that we have all gone through over the last few years and even are still experiencing in our world and in our society. And this opportunity to uh, engage in this practice um, is something that we all have access to and it's, it's vital in, in deepening our relationship with God. So. With that, I hope you are encouraged to open yourself up to this opportunity, and I pass it on to Jill so she can guide us through this practice. Thank you, Danielle. So um, <clears throat> while you're not going to be asked unless you want to share something about your experience or the experience of lament, you're not going to be asked about your own prayer of lament. Uh, that we're working through and going to walk through together now. Uh, but I do encourage you, if uh, you can, to grab some paper, grab something to write with. Um, 
as you could tell from uh, Pastor Jay, um, it, it, this process really calls something deep um, out to us. It's a, it's a really um, powerful invitation to express things that perhaps we as church don't allow or encourage ourselves and one another to do. And so, you know, jot these things down. It's a prayer that may, um, you may want to keep uh, and pray um, again and again. Um, so we're going to take, uh, take our time and we're going to start the prayer the way we start most prayers is by addressing God. How, how do you feel about addressing God tonight? What, what name, what words of, of greeting or pleading or, um, beginning of conversation would you use tonight as we sit with those things within ourselves and around us that cause disquiet and lament. So think about that. How might you draw God into this conversation within you? Perhaps you have a, a way that you typically address God at the beginning of prayer. That may be what you feel now. You may choose another way of calling upon God. So just take a moment to do that. Thank you, Courtney, for that reiteration. We will not be asked to share this, the pieces of this prayer with, it, with anyone tonight. Okay, so the next piece is complaint. And I don't know about everyone, but I know that I was not really raised to commonly complain to God. Um, the culture was very much Give thanks to God for good things, and uh, but don't you raise your voice to God about bad things. And so um, tonight I invite you, think about what do you long for? What do you wish were true about your life, about your congregation, your community, the world? What losses are you experiencing or have you experienced? What are your fears about what has been, about what could be? What are the things churning within you that you maybe have hesitated to name? It's often helpful for us to recognize that our, our lament can be about ways that we've been hurt, as well as ways that we have perhaps caused hurt. We've been a party to that. You can address God, we encourage you to address God as you. This is a conversation with God. This is prayer to God. Um, refer to ourselves as I, this is, this is between us and God. Take a moment if you need to think. You may, like I did when we as a group did this activity, you may find that you have a rather lengthy list and you're surprised by it. Or it might be that things are not rising to the surface right now, or that there's one thing that's sitting on your heart. Some may, um, we're gonna take a couple of minutes here. So I encourage you to take a deep breath. Be present, be assured that God receives what is coming forth in this prayer. I'll tell you what I say to the congregation when we have evening prayer in midweek Lent. Silence is not natural or comfortable for us. And so please know that I'm leaving a little time here. I'm keeping that time. I'm not leaving you here or forgetting um, that there's a next step. But this 
getting in touch with our longings and our losses, our fears and our anger, frustration. Um, this is really the heart of this prayer. perhaps more specific to church life, but certainly for all of life, what have you missed in recent months or even years? And what, are, what fears do you have about the new normal, what that may look like, what may be missing from it, or maybe there that is fearful? Okay, now, now we're going to move on to the next stage, but if you're still working, don't be afraid if the lament, the complaint continues to rise up in the hours and days to come. The next piece is confession. We're invited to confess, and confession, of, as we know from practicing it, practicing it so much together in worship, is it's more than just a list of, I did this, and I am sorry. It's a way of bringing our need to God and that need is often forgiveness grace that unbounded unlimited love of God that doesn't have any prerequisites on our part where do you need God's grace and for God's forgiveness in your life And again, if you're finished, we're going to stay here for a moment. Take a deep breath. Okay, we're going to move forward. Definitely related to the piece of this prayer, which is confession, is the plea, the asking for God's help. What do you want God to do for you or for your congregation, your family, the community where you live? communities in and around the world. What within yourself do you ask God's help for? This is an opportunity to look at those losses and longings that you, um, that you listed, that you wrote during the complaint and express them as a request of God. How do your laments, your complaints lead you to ask God for help? What do you request from God?
Again, this is a piece we're gonna take a little bit of time with. Don't let the silence um, make you uncomfortable. Or if it does make you uncomfortable, maybe that's a piece of the prayer for you as well. This is an opportunity to think about not what you think you should ask God for, what do you long to ask God for help with? What help do you really long for from God? Okay, we'll move forward now. And this is this is the piece of lamenting that Judy so eloquently, Pastor Judy so eloquently led us in as we went through um, Psalm 146. This is the part where we affirm our trust in God, and it might be a feeling of clinging to trust, or it might be a deep, confident trust. Um, express, affirm in whatever words or way seem um, fitting to you now, your trust in God. Your trust in God, God's guidance and help in your life, God's leadership in your congregation. Imagine the shape that God's faithfulness will take. How do you envision or how might you express what God's response to your lament would look like on the ground, within you, in your heart, in your home and family congregation and workplace, whatever is the place where you're really longing right now. So the last piece, <laughs> sorry about that. And you can go back um, and fill in more of this prayer later. The outline was sent with the, the Zoom invite. And frankly, this is a practice which I intend to continue in writing um, in my own prayer life because it is so, it's such a good um, way of being led through this process of lament. Think about how you might Give words to your promise to praise God. When God has shown up, when that vision of God's response to your lament begins to take shape and form, whether in the way you expected or perhaps in a way that you would never have expected, God tends to like to do that sometimes too. Promise to praise God. What does that promise sound like from your lips and your pen? What are you confident God will do in the future, even if you don't see it yet? How has God, we join the psalmists in this and, and also listen, um, listen to the Psalms, this, uh, the Psalm this Sunday. We join the people of Israel in looking to God's faithfulness in the past as a, as a lead in to our confidence and our trust. Again, however confident or however grasping and at the moment. So think about ways that God has been faithful, which you have seen in the past and which bolster your hope that God will, prom will fulfill God's promise and will show up. People of Israel were um, have have been in the practice of pointing again and again to the Exodus, right? Pointing again and again to how God brought God's people out of slavery after they 
feeling forgotten for so long and how beautifully and dramatically God continued to be faithful on the twists and turns of that journey out of slavery and into freedom. What are some of the touchstone pieces of God's faithfulness in the past that you cling to in hope for the future? The next part of our time together is uh, gonna happen in breakout rooms so that we can discuss what the, this experience was like. Um, and uh, I think someone else is gonna introduce how we're going to discuss that. Yeah, that's me. Danielle, if you'll move on to the next page for us. Thank you. Um, Thanks, we're going to spend some time in breakout groups, um, and these are the two questions you'll be invited to talk about um, and share as much as you're comfortable and don't feel the need to share if you're not. Um, we're going to offer up a few minutes of sharing. Um, if you are interested in sharing anything from your experience of this or that you heard in your group that you have permission to share out loud, um, please raise your hand either physically or um, using the raise hand feature, which I believe is under reactions at the bottom of your screen. Um, so if there's anyone looking to share, uh, please do so. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Kathy. Okay, our group had, um, actually there was one gentleman who had a great example. Um, they have a visitor who is Jewish and occasionally joins their congregation and then you know complains that he hates god and it was felt by this gentleman that this would be a good tool or a template for him to use so that he could express his lament so he plans on sharing with him the next time this gentleman comes in thank you Yeah, Suzanne. Well, I'll just share what we are, how we ended was that uh, we, um, David, I think it was, that said, uh, you know, we were taught the acts order of prayer, um, affirmation, confession, um, uh, what's T stand for? And supplication. But that we should add an L in there for, <laughs> so we're trying to figure out the new acronym to add an L lament because it really was, uh, meaningful and thoughtful and thought provoking. Um, so, so, uh, that would be a, a, a good letter to add to that acronym. <laughs> Thanksgiving. Thank you. Jane. Thanksgiving. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. I hadn't heard of acts before. I like that. Oh, no. there you go. Oh, can I go next here? Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Um, there were several um, things in our team, but one of the uh, neatest thing that, that I heard was that we thought it might be hard to do this exercise, but it turned it out to be so much easier, especially because of the prompts that were offered. And those prompts were greatly appreciated. Um, and also the fact that it was okay to complain to God giving us that permission was helpful. Um, anybody else in our team want to say something about that? I, I think that we, we felt that it, it would give a voice to people maybe who don't have the words, you know, on, on what to say when they're grieving, they're sad, or they're in a really bad place. And, um, you know, that, that that helps people move forward in the relationship with God. And we were thankful for that. Thank you. I'm going to reiterate that before Lynn jumps in, but this is your permission from now, forever and ever. Amen. It is okay to complain to God. <laughs> Take that with you. Lynn, if you're willing to share. It came up in our group um, about getting the youth involved in this as, as a way to express how they're feeling. 
um, you know, if, if they don't always necessarily know how to find the words, maybe this would help them. Um, and that this is a way to express how we're all really feeling with just everything that's been going on for the past years, everything going on now, just again, sometimes if you're fumbling for words, maybe this is a way to help express how we're all, and it's okay to express how we're really feeling. Absolutely. Um, Charlotte, was that a hand? Oh, I think she was waving to me. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> we were waving <laughs> to each other. <laughs> Sorry. One of the best parts about Zoom. It's just been funny because it's like, who am I waving at? <laughs> Is there anyone else that feels comfortable sharing? I'll share quickly. Thanks. I think something that I'm taking away, especially from our conversation tonight, is that um, not only using these prompts, but also just really taking the time to engage in the spiritual practice. I think, yes, it's giving ourselves the permission to complain, but also not stopping there and ending it with that, um, that confidence and faith of, God, I'm coming to you because I know you can handle this. God, I'm coming to you because you've seen it all. <laughs> you've heard it all. And quite frankly, you already know what's on my heart and mind and soul. Um, and so, yes, complaining, but also ending with that um, capstone of, of faith and knowing that whatever that we're dealing with or going through or uh, lamenting is um is out of our hands and that you know god's got it and god's got us and that reminder thank you i know my group talked about kind of how it was really nice to have that conclusion that ending of of praise and that reminder of god and i kind of used the image that when we complain a lot as someone who does this, um, we can go down a rabbit hole and we can get stuck there, especially with everything going on in the world. And so one of the things that I appreciated in um, these prompts is that that conclusion of giving it all back to God is kind of like God is the rabbit at the bottom of your rabbit hole, pushing it back up. We've got another minute or two. Is there anyone else that feels called to share anything? Double I just want to say that was a great image. That was a fantastic image of the rabbit. Thank you. You're welcome. Peter, was that a hand? Yes. I, I would just dare say that um, We've got so a third of the Psalms are said to be lamentation, la, laments. And uh, there is so much there that if you just start looking at some of them, you just, you know, like 130, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. I mean, the, you know, I, I think these really teach us. We can really use those words to find new words for ourselves and to just feel what's in our, you know, what's inside of us. And, um, you know, they're about waiting, they're uh, about all different parts of, of, of lamenting. They've got hope, but the hope is like, how long do I hope? You know, I'm hoping and hoping and waiting and waiting and I'm looking for the morning and when is the morning gonna really get there? Um, the, the tools are right there. I mean, we've done a nice job of laying out the kinds of things that are in there. But if we look at some of these Psalms, um, they really illustrate and give us, give us a great deal. So I just think that's a powerful thing. And, you know, and I'm not anybody. So when I'm trying to encourage somebody that this is fine, I need to go to something of authority and this is it. You know, that those are the words right here. God's word shows us. I think that's, that's great. 
anyway. You all Thank know. You. Thank you, Peter. And you are somebody, you are a beloved child of God created in God's image and you use God's word to empower and help others. And so that is, makes you worthy of being somebody. You are absolutely, as is everybody here. And remember that um, God loves you and you're created in God's image. With that, um, thank you again to everybody for engaging in this practice. Um, please take it home with you. Try it again. Try it in your communities. Let us know how it works. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Maristella. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, my heart is full <laughs> because tonight uh, we'll have the honor to have with us Pastor, uh, Pastor Jessica Lambert, um, who is the former pastor of St. Paul in Jersey City and last summer moved to uh, Copperstown in New York. Uh, but is able to be with us tonight to share of one of the experience of the congregation there. So we are so glad to have you, Jess. <laughs> it's so great to be with you and to see so many familiar faces. I miss my, my colleagues in New Jersey, even though, I, so I moved to Cooperstown because my husband, who's an Episcopal priest, um, got called to serve as rector of um, the Episcopal Church here in Cooperstown. So I am currently on leave from call and discerning um, where I'm going to fit in in this new community and so forth. So the, the local Lutheran pastor has four tiny churches. <laughs> so I will, um, you know, help him when I can. And I've, I've preached at the Presbyterian church and the Methodist church. And so I'm getting to know all kinds of, of fun people. Um, but yes, at St. Paul's, we, um, we did a study of the Psalms and, and talked about how they can help us um, express lament, express anger, express the desire for retribution and revenge and, and also the need for forgiveness and, and that hope um, is embedded in all of that. We also uh, practiced, used um, laments um, to pray for an end to, to racism and racism in the church, racism in ourselves. So we used um, many different formulas. We, we studied books. Um, if you, I have a couple of book recommendations that I really, um, we got so much out of. And one is called Rachel's Cry. It's by Kathleen Billman, and it is about prayers of lament. The other book um, is a little more theological, uh, making a case for lament. It's called Prophetic Lament by Sung Chan Ra, and I can put these in the chat when I'm done. Um, some of you may also, I'm, for my Lenten devotionals this year, I'm reading Kate Bowler's new book. She's the author of, of several books, um, including recently No Cure for Being Human. But she has this Lenten book this year called Good Enough. And I just want to read you a couple of sentences from a recent, one of the recent days. She writes, all good things that can come from prayer, trust, acceptance, connection, occasional miracles, are there waiting for us. But first comes radical honesty. The more genuine our prayers, the more freedom there is to acknowledge the reality of all a life with God can be. In the meantime, tell God all of it fiercely, even the unanswered prayers, don't leave out a single one. Even if you sit among broken things and your confidence seems to shrink with each day, know that you may feel lonely, but you are not alone. You are united in love with all of suffering humanity and with our God who came to suffer and die, a God of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but one who also came that we might have life. And so as at St. Paul's, as we were 
learning about lament and and part of the reason we started the study was I kept hearing people say things like I'm sorry I haven't been in church for a while I'm my life is such a mess um, I'm just I can't get it together and I can't I can't come to church when I'm a mess and it just made me want to weep <laughs> because of course we know that church is exactly it should be a community where where people run to when they're a mess um, that that the institutional church has become a place where we must keep up appearances where we must keep our sorrows to ourselves our pain our losses um, our wounds to ourselves is is very sad and so one of the things that we did that was the most powerful, taking it from what felt like more um, abstract look at the importance of lament, was I just bought a big whiteboard, dry erase whiteboard, and I put it on an easel uh, near the front of the church. And I would write a question on it every Sunday morning, or my kids would, they loved coming up with these questions. But most often, the question was, what's keeping you up at night? Um, and that question is, uh, scares people at first, people would come in and be and say, Oh, I, mm, no, I'm not going to go there. And they would walk by it and sit down. Occasionally, some people would stop. But I noticed that during communion after people had received communion they would go over there and write things um, until the board was full and people of all ages would write things um, and i would take a picture of it i wish i still had some of these pictures because it was extraordinary some some time people would draw pictures some people would write small paragraphs scribble um and i would then incorporate one or two paragraphs into the prayers of the people the following sunday so i would sit with those struggles of what people what was keeping people up at night throughout the week and i would incorporate them into the prayers of the people so sometimes a child would write thunder and lightning Sometimes it was terrifying dreams of uh, being poor, homelessness, um, racism. So, you know, my sister. Um, and so I would then have to find ways to express those fears and anxieties and longings and sad sorrows. Um, in the prayer and people would then hear their their uh, late night fears being addressed um, in worship and it was a way for people to feel uh, heard and acknowledged and uh, you know that question what keeps you up at night is such a different kind of question than we <laughs> ever ask each other you know, it's very different from how are you or how's your hip or um, how are your kids doing? Are they okay? It, it gets to the molten core of, of our existence, um, our, our fears and losses and um, terrors. And I knew that a lot of my parishioners were up all night who struggled with sleeplessness for many years. Um, so this was a way to get inside and to get people um, to put words to those night terrors and um, uh, rumination and to, and to put words to them and to hear them and to hear others, to hear that a child is frightened of thunder in the middle of the night. Uh, creates compassion and, and empathy to hear that someone else besides you 
is up all night afraid of being evicted um, is incredibly binding and um, and generative so that that's what we did and and you know sometimes we used a different question but we always came back to what keeps you up at night um, because it was it was such a um, a deep place of connection um, and a, and something that really needed to be to be offered to God. And I can answer any questions if you have any questions about that. But um, but I encourage something like that. Great idea. I see Shara. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Sharla, you are muted. I was clapping, not raising my oh. hand. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> Pastor Carol? Uh, Jessica, can you can you suggest some of your other questions that you offered? Because I'm I'm very curious about this. Very interesting. Sure. Yeah. Sometimes they were um, questions like what um, just simply, what are you, what are you praying for this week? Um, who, who's on your mind? Um, what is making your heart thankful? Um, or what is weighing your heart down? Um, what have you, what have you noticed in your neighborhood this week that is life giving? Questions like that, the, and um, my kids liked they if they got there first, they would some usually write questions like, um, you know, uh, who do you want to pray for, or what uh, what's making you sad, uh, or what's what's giving you joy. Pastor Jess, I see a, a question from Lynn. Uh, did people feel comfortable writing these things for you and uh, congregation to see? At, f at first, not, you know, like I said, that sometimes they would walk in and, and, and see that. And I think that the, the gut reaction was, I can't reveal that. That's, that's too, too ugly, too deep, too um, painful, you know, um, I think sometimes we feel like we won't, we won't survive if we reveal um, those kinds of incredibly deep um, yearnings and sorrows. But I think doing it in the midst of liturgy and giving people time, to, you know, through the confession and hearing God's word and um, singing and then receiving communion, something loosened, something, and not everyone did it, of course. Some, for some people, it was too, too much, too personal, or, or had a hard time articulating it. But even from those who, who did not write things down, um, I got feedback that it was prompting them to try and articulate it to themselves um and and be more aware of what was keeping them up at night um so i think but but many people were felt it was a a, a way to pray together as a community in and um you know, using different colored markers, again, drawing a picture instead of using words, um, and doing it while pe other people in the congregation were singing hymns and they could, they could write it and take time um, after communion. Um, they did feel comfortable. Many people did feel comfortable. I see Pastor Danielle. I'm curious to know if um, 
this practice, obviously it was going on for a while. So people probably got more comfortable as it went along. But I'm curious to know if you noticed um, a difference in, did this correlate or lead to any um, ways that people were reaching out to you personally uh, for pastoral care? Like, because this question had gotten them thinking more, they were more comfortable to share these things with you. Did you notice any differences in that? Yeah, I noticed it um, with people wanting to talk to me, but also to each other. Um, you know, we would begin every, every congregational meeting that we had with some kind of um, either one-on-one -on -one conversation or small group con conversation. And we wouldn't, I, I think a couple times we used this question was keeping you up at night, but we often used other questions. And I found that people and people expressed this, that they we're much more eager to share having having done this practice over and over again um you know that that they felt more trusting um that they felt they could be more vulnerable um and yeah and you know i think sm some small groups were formed among people who had um similar, similar wonderings and questions and, and fears. Um, and they were able to support each other. A bunch of people found each other who all had MS. They didn't know that they each <laughs> had MS and they were kind of suffering alone. And, and because of these prayers, they found each other. Um, and that was great. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor uh, Jessica, for um, being with us tonight and um, sharing these ideas and this way of prayer uh, that points to, again, a uh, way of uh, listening and learning from each other. Um, so uh, thanks. For Can I say one more thing? Yes, please. I was just going to say, I know in, in some congregations during the, the prayers of the people, there's kind of an open time where people can can speak aloud their prayers. That was never something that people at St. Paul's were very comfortable with. And so this was a different way where they could think about kind of what they wanted to say, and then it would be prayed on their behalf by the assisting minister in, during the prayers of the people the next Sunday. Um, and so that, that also, I think, helped um, allow them, many of them to, to be willing to be more vulnerable. So thanks. Thank you. And uh, going towards the end of our session tonight, uh, one member of our team who is um, Vicar uh, Diane Lewis, uh, she is not able uh, to participate on Thursday uh, for the in the beginning of the year because of classes, but she will be uh, uh, starting in June. Uh, and she has a word to share with us in the way of encouraging us uh, with this practice of lament. And it's a video. Danielle, I think it's with you. Hi, I'm Vicar Diane. I'm sorry I'm not able to be with you today, but I know today we're going to be talking about lament. And lament is something that belongs to each one of us. Lament and racial injustice. These are truths that we all deal with daily. Many congregations would rather have both left on the outside of the church doors instead of in the pulpit. But we as clergy have been called by God to speak truths. But do understand, lament doesn't belong to the marginalized, nor does it belong to the privilege. 
Lament is a cleansing for each one of us. It allows us to get closer to God. Yes, some of us will lament more than others. As an African-American woman, yes, I have lamented a lot because I live in a world where a system was designed to oppress me. As some would say, a system that always has its knee on my neck. But then I know that I serve a mighty God who liberates me, who saves me from all of any wickedness that may come upon me. But as I said, lament is just not about racial injustice. No, lament is, is things that we experience. When I was thinking about this exercise and what I most recently lamented about was the loss of a loved one. And I wrote, almighty and loving God, why have you allowed me to walk into this space of mourning without help from my siblings? My siblings turn away from me. I'm disappointed in my loved one that they have left me in a situation that is more difficult than I care to be in. You see, this is lament. Lament are the things that we struggle with that are difficult for us. But we remember in our lamenting, and I say, Lord, your grace gives me strength and courage. And because you fill me with your spirit, I'm able to walk forward knowing I'm not alone because you promise you will pass through the waters that when I pass through the waters, you will be with me. When I pass through the rivers, you would not let them sweep over me. And for this reason, yes, and for this reason, I say, I know that you are near to me, Lord. And therefore I rejoice. I rejoice knowing that although I lament, I am not in that wilderness alone. So I just say, lament doesn't belong to those on the margins, the marginalized. It doesn't belong to the privilege. Lament is our way of cleansing ourselves, allowing the Holy Spirit to not only be on us, but to live in us. We must remember that if we are to get closer to God, then we have to be willing to lament. If we can't lament, we cannot grow in Christ. Because when we lament, Christ, God comes to our rescue. Remember, God has come in this world, but this world is not fully God. And until we allow ourselves to lament so that we can be filled with the love of God, then we are lost. So I say, embrace lament. Pray about lament. The peace of Christ be with you all. God bless you. Pastor Jay, I think you will send us out. Yes, I will. Thank you. Um, so, as always, we have resources available for you and that we sent in the email. Uh, one of them was the Prayer of Lament by Reverend Maggie McLeod. There's a service of lament. And as we uh, practiced in the beginning of this session, uh, the prayer of lament that came out of the All Creation Sings, the new hymnal that came out this past year. Um, those were some resources that you might be able to uh, glean from. Also, um, we have other resources. For example, um, the notes from these sessions will be available. And as I, since we're recording the sessions, these recordings will be available at some point for us too. So that should be helpful. We'd like to 
offer this time for you to um, co-create with God as you exercise all of these things. How are you listening to your congregation? We want you to ex continue exploring these questions as you're listening to your congregation. Keep discerning how God is showing up in your congregation. And the ultimate question is to ask where God might be active in your congregation. So now I send you away with a blessing. Receive now the blessing of God, for you are children of the Creator, anointed with the oil of gladness, strengthened for the journey. May Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless and preserve you today and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. See you all on April 28th. Go and listen. Listen will be our next focus. Bye-bye.